Hi, thanks again for tuning in to our daily inspiration. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us, and hopefully what we have for you here will be edifying. Anyway, this is going to be another short video, and for this one I'd like to share something from the exorcist Father Daniel Rehill about the Incuba spirit. But of course, the point here is not to simply share about the case that's related to that evil spirit. Rather, it's to share the reason why it was there in the first place, which Father Rehill briefly explained here in this clip. Um, currently, I have a few cases I'm dealing with that's an incubus spirit, one of the most repulsive because it actually sexually abuses people. Um, but you need to invite it in to some degree. And, and this is where people get tripped up. Uh, so there was a woman who's a lawyer and she uh, self-professed Gnostic, didn't care if there was a God. It, she wasn't interested in it. And she had something moving around in her bedroom at night. So she finally said to the thing, if you're if there's something present here, grab my hand and something grabbed her hand. So for most people, that would be like a sign to say this is a problem. There's something in my room that I can't identify and who knows what else it's going to do. But she didn't do that. She developed a conversation with this thing, uh, asking for like yes and no answers through moving things in the room and whatnot. And eventually it progressed to, she said it kissed her and she didn't swat it off and say, no, I, I don't want that. And, and eventually now it's having sex with her and then it's raping her. And now she doesn't like it. And that's when I get called to come in. But, you know, it's always this case. And I, and I had three at once of the same thing. It's always kind of strange because you're like, well, why is this suddenly and popping up everywhere? Uh, and one of them was a man. These spirits don't have gender, but they can Im impersonate gender. And he he said to me, in all honesty, you know, so I woke up half awake and didn't really know what's happening, but I felt like my genitals were being stimulated and he he was enjoying it. So he may, he had this thought, well, whatever this is, I, I like it. So if you're not schooled in this, like, think about it. If you're half day sleeping in and out, you're not really paying attention. It, it's easy to be tricked into giving the thing permission. So that's what I'm seeing right now. Um, I, I'm not sure uh, why that happens, you know, to some degree. Um, I also think that people that are curious are more at risk because they're more open to like just testing things and seeing what happens, playing these games with, you know, whatnot, Ouija boards and things like that, uh, because they don't believe it. And if you think this is all made up, of course, you're going to go into it thinking, how could I get hurt? It's not real until they do get hurt and then you know then you have to call somebody for help i hope that was helpful and more importantly please remember father rehill's advice at the end of the clip anyway for the second part of this video i'd like to share something about judas iscariot simply put i'd like to share four facts about judas and his betrayal as we know while many in jerusalem plotted a way to get rid of jesus it wasn't until judas came into the picture that they had a firm plan Judas was chosen by Jesus to be an apostle and likely helped the other apostles in spreading the good news about Jesus Christ. Yet, in the great mystery of evil and human freedom, we know that seeing the miracles of Jesus and hearing him preach were not enough for Judas. Judas betrayed Jesus, an action that set into motion the events of Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection. And so here are four quick facts about Judas and the effects of his betrayal. Number 1. Spy Wednesday As the days of Holy Week move forward, Various events occur that directly lead to what will take place on Good Friday. Among these events was the fateful betrayal of Jesus by one of his own followers. Then one of the twelve went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment he sought an opportunity to betray Jesus. This action by Judas earned him the title of spy by medieval Christians in accord with the traditional definition of the English word, one who keeps secret watch on a person or thing to obtain information. From Wednesday onward, Judas secretly watched for a chance to turn Jesus over to the chief priests, and so many Christians labeled this day as Spy Wednesday. Now we're on point number two. How much might Judas' 30 pieces of silver be worth today? There are several different interpretations. One theory is that the pieces of silver used to pay Judas were equivalent to a Roman denarius. A Roman soldier, for example, was paid about 225 denarii per year, in comparison, a modern-day U.S. military soldier earns about $25,000 a year. In this interpretation, Judas would have been paid about $3,000 in today's value. On the other hand, various biblical scholars instead point to Exodus, where it describes 30 pieces of silver as the price of a slave. And so, based on these interpretations, 
Judas could have been paid anywhere between $90 and $3,000 in today's sums. Number 3. Comparing Judas and Peter Comparing Judas and Peter is a good exercise to help us consider how we handle our own sins. As this reflection notes, we have the chance to repent. Peter the Apostle wept bitterly, the scriptures tell us, and repented of his sin. When his resurrected master greeted him, surely he was amazed that he was neither killed nor excoriated but forgiven, restored and entrusted with a great mission. The risen Christ commissioned his repentant traitor with these words, Feed my sheep. Judas, seeing upon his own hands the blood of an innocent man, his very master, despaired and died by his own hand. By sin, we separate ourselves from Christ. Yet while we live may still repent and find the mercy that cost Christ so dearly. But by his despair, Judas refused to let himself be found by the risen and merciful Christ. And finally, number four, the replacement apostle, St. Matthias. While little is known about his life, the appointment of Matthias as an apostle is the earliest evidence the Catholic Church has of apostolic succession, explaining why even today popes and bishops are chosen to replace those who went before them. His life also reminds us that the twelve apostles were not the only ones who followed Jesus throughout his public ministry. There were many others, including someone called Joseph, who almost became Judas' replacement instead of Matthias. Jesus attracted a crowd of people wherever he went, and some of them continued to follow him, while others left when his teachings were difficult. Matthias was one who gladly accepted Jesus' teaching and was willing to be a witness to his resurrection, even if it cost him his life. Well then, that will be all for the video this time. I hope all of you have learned a lot from this rather short video. And again, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. And if there's any feedback or suggestion, please don't hesitate to let me know. Anyway, until the next one, stay safe, stay healthy, and may God bless you. I think as we step back and, and look at the world, it's a mess. I mean, let's face it, wars and violence and terrorism, people turning away from the Lord, uh, people turning to the occult and witchcraft, and just, it's just a mess, it's awful. And so, what does uh, the Lord want from us? What does the world need from us? It needs saints. Just a few saints can change the history of humankind. So the Lord needs you to be a saint. You say to yourself, well, I can't do that. And the, and the answer is, no, no, you can. But the secret to sanctity is not us doing it, it's letting the Lord do that through us. When we allow the Lord to work through us, that's, that's what makes sense. So, number one, I want you to every day uh, in the morning when you wake up, offer yourself to the Lord. Say, Lord, work through me today. Let your grace, yes, your spirit come upon me and make me a saint this day. And then there are some practical things you can do which the church provides some real important means to sanctity. Of course, going to Mass on Sunday, we see the Eucharist, but many of you might be able to go to Mass more often during the week and some daily Mass, wonderful. Go to confession regularly, at least once a month if you want to be a saint. You know, go more often. So it's, it's a powerful grace. And then I've noticed uh, when people will, for example, go to Eucharistic adoration, uh, pray in, the, in front of the tabernacle, or just, especially when the Eucharist is exposed, I've seen so marvelous uh, transformations happen to people who do Eucharistic adoration. So spending time with the Lord, or if you can't, just do it in your home. Spending time with the Lord, letting Him work through you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I trust in you. And in the end, when we love Jesus, we trust in him and let us work through us. That's what makes saints. And you are needed more than ever. Heaven needs you. The earth needs you. It's a mess. This world is a mess. Heaven needs your help. So let us today resolve to let Jesus work through us. So repeat after me. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I open my heart to you. Jesus, fill me with your presence. May your Holy Spirit guide me. And let us say with St. Paul, it is no longer I who live, 
but Christ who lives in thee. And God bless you.